Hi everyone, here we are for chapter nine, language. And this is the last chapter in our cognitive development section. Okay, so in this lecture, I'm going to cover language structure, all the components of language, uh, the general time frame for language development across the lifespan, some general language acquisition theories, and then a little bit on literacy and bilingualism. Okay, so let's start with language. What is it, right? It's communication. It can be spoken, written, signed, like ASL, but you're always going to have some agreed upon system of symbols. So having your own unique language, like when one of my kids was three years old and said he had his own language, that doesn't really qualify as a language if no one understands you. It has to be something where you can communicate. And it can even include things like texting. So what are the different components of language? We're gonna start from the smallest unit and go to the largest. The smallest is phonemes. So phonemes are the sounds of language. You can think of this as like the alphabet, but it's not exactly equivalent because if you know in English, we have some sounds like the letter C, that could be two different sounds, right? It could be S or K. So C is kind of a frustrating letter in our alphabet. So anyway, phonemes are the sounds of language. So in English, that's a, ah, s, k, e, u, f, v, b, l, er, w. Okay, I can go on and on. Um, I have an entire uh, hour and a half lecture on phonemes in my speech and hearing class. So we're only using one line in this class. Now, if we combine phonemes together, we can make a morpheme. And a morpheme is a meaningful unit of language. So that could be an entire word, like let's say the word dog, D-O-G, D-O-G. Three phonemes combined, dog, to make dog. And that means something, right? It's an animal, it's a pet. I just took my dog on a walk. Now we could also change it and add another phoneme, like dogs. So we've added the z onto the end and we know that that means there's more than one dog, right? Plural. So this is two different kinds of phonemes. We've got a totally free morpheme dog that can stand on its own and then we have prefixes and suffixes that really can't stand on their own. They're what are called bound to that free morpheme. So um I-N-G, E-D, and then of course prefixes like un, re, um, things like that, which are going to change the meaning. Okay, the next level is syntax. Um, and I put in uh, parentheses grammar because I've always thought of it as grammar. So I, I'm trying to remind myself that syntax and grammar are the same here. Um, they're the rules for how you combine, combine these morphemes and words into phrases and sentences. So the rules of English or the rules of Spanish or whatever your language is. Um, you know, I hope, that the syntax differs between different languages. And then semantics is the meaning of words and phrases, right? So you can have words combined, it's grammatically correct, but does it mean anything, right? There's a really famous uh, line um, that shows this um, disconnect between semantic, synt syntax and semantics, right? It's a colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Colorless green. How can you be colorless and green? How can I, an idea sleep? How can you sleep furiously? The sentence has proper syntax, but the meaning is nonsense. Okay, so then our last component of language is pragmatics. This is a very interesting area to me. Um, this is how the context of the situation affects your meaning, how your tone of voice can affect your meaning. Um, a really simple one is saying, um, uh, today was a great day. 
or today was a great day. Hopefully you can tell I meant two different things. Just by the change in tone um, and maybe my facial expressions, nonverbal cues go into pragmatics, your body language, like I said, your facial expressions, tone, rate and rhythm of your speech, all of these things can be used to convey meaning that's not the exact syntax or semantics, right? It's more um, a layer on top of all that. Okay, so that's all we're gonna cover with language structure. These are um, the way we can break it down. So let's look across the lifespan at some of our major develop developments. So in infancy and toddlerhood, before we even get into how infants and toddlers are communicating, I just want to bring up um, what's called infant directed speech. It's also sometimes called, or previously called motherese, and then parentese because of course you don't have to be a mother to use infant directed speech or child directed speech. This is the way adults talk to infants and sometimes even toddlers. And let's be honest, sometimes even their pets, right? If I'm holding a baby, interacting with that baby, wish I had a baby doll right now, I would be like, oh, you're such a good baby. Oh, now what I'm doing is exaggerating vowel sounds, exaggerating my facial movements while I'm talking. Um, and sometimes this is called baby talk, right? Maybe you talk to your dog like this. You don't talk to a baby like it's an adult. You're not like, what are you doing, baby? It's just totally weird, right? You use this infant-directed or child-directed speech. And there was a period in time where... Um, Maybe pediatricians and other psychologists thought that this was not beneficial to treat your babies like babies. But we know now that it actually is. This exaggeration of speech sounds and motor movements is beneficial for infants to see um, and to model, to learn how to start moving their uh, facial muscles to make those sounds and to copy you. So there's nothing wrong with baby talk, that infant-directed speech, um, maybe not with your adult friends. That's weird. <laughs> okay, so before people can say their first words, can they communicate? Yes. And this is what's called pre-linguistic speech. This would include crying and cooing and gestures, right? Babies can communicate right away, right? First off, they can just cry to try to get attention, to get their needs met. Um, and that's pre-linguistic speech. Thankfully, they start to learn to make more pleasant noises. Um, and I'll have an example in a minute of a whole bunch of different types of linguistic, pre-linguistic speech. On average, kids will hit that milestone of saying their first word right around age one. And um, it's important that a first word meets certain criteria. Um, I can tell you my mom said, oh, you're so smart. You said your first word when you were four months old. You said mama. No, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, she can say that. And I probably did babble it randomly. But that's not a first word. A first word has to be said purposefully by the child, it's meaningful, it's understood by other people that are not mom and dad, and it's in different contexts. So I was able to get a um, recording of my younger child's first word. So hey, Luke. here we go. Hi. You wanna say hi? No, no. No, no? Why not? You gonna clean up instead? No. No? So no was his first no. word that he said no. consistently. <laughs> There's some pre-linguistic speech. Squeals. No. No? No. No? No. Did you eat mac and cheese? Mom, no. look, I did it. Mom, I did it. What's Luke's new word today? <laughs> Mama. No, no. No. Hi, Luke. Silly boy. Mom. Say peekaboo. I'm going to get a bill. This is my quadrat. <gasps> Hi. <laughs> How 
had to get the screams in there at the end. All right, so he is practicing his pre-linguistic speech, lots of squeals, screams, um, noises, it didn't do any raspberries, but blow, putting your lips together and spitting, basically. Um, but then saying a first word that's recognizable. What we also start to see is kids develop these single words. They start to increase their vocabulary. They go from maybe having their first word to having five words, maybe up to even 20 words. Um, we can see how they're trying to organize these labels, these words, symbols for what's in the environment. And so we can typically see underextensions of word meanings and overextensions of word meanings. So um, for example, an underextension is when, let's say you learn um, that you have a dog, I have a dog, her name's Abby, and maybe in your mind you think Abby is a dog, she is the dog. And then when you go out in the neighborhood and there are other dogs, you think, well, that can't be a dog because I have the dog, <laughs> right? That's not, that's underextending when you don't realize dog is actually a category and Abby is one example. Now, overextension is when you apply something to more than it should, right? And this is um, done a lot by little kids and probably one of the easiest ones is an example. I was um, out shopping at Kohl's with my kids once and one of them went up to an older woman who had gray hair and said, hi, grandma. She was not happy about that because I guess she wasn't a grandma and didn't think my kids were cute, which is fine. Uh, thinking that all women with gray hair are called grandma is overextension. Okay. As they get older, they start to put words together and now you have two word phrases and kids will have what's called telegraphic speech. Telegraphic speech is, the name is inspired by the telegraph, which is an ancient communication machine. You can um, kind of think of it like um, the original Twitter. So you've got um, before telephones, before computers, um, the telegraph allowed people to send messages and you had to pay by the character. So typically telegraphs were very short and only contained the um, content, major content words and smaller words were left out. So this is what it sounds like when you hear a two year old who has telegraphic speech. This is kind of a longer video, but I got a speech sample of Luke here um, at age two, Inside. definitely doing some uh, telegraphic it. speech. Uh -huh. Do you like Lily? Uh -huh. Do you like Vicky and Terry too? Uh -huh. What are you making? What are you making? Bubble blow. See? Bubble, Bubble blow? Bubble. What do you see? Builder. A builder. No Gary? Not, no not Gary, a builder. Gary's inside. Gary's inside. That's right. Right? Right. No Gary? No Gary? No Gary. Hey, do you want to sing a song, Luke? Uh -huh. No. No? You want to sing Happy Birthday? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, sing happy birthday. Okay. I hit my really far. I know, Cole. Is that how it goes? Happy birthday to you. Ooh. <gasps> Loud. Loud. That's no. Loud. No, no. I'm talking to Luke right now. Are we talking? Uh huh. You have no hat? Bubble hat. The bubble hit your head? Bubble hat. Hit the hat. Hit the hat. Yeah. yeah. Hey Luke, do you have a boo-boo? Right there? No boo-boo. No boo-boo. No boo-boo? No boo-boo. Or yes, boo-boo. 
Your band-aid? Okay, so you get the point here, right? Obviously, I was kind of translating a bit since I can understand what he was saying at the time, but he's just saying like off a band-aid, no boo-boo, bubble head, head, hit head, right? This is all telegraphic speech. Okay, so we move into early childhood, age three, four, five, everything is improving, everything is becoming more complex. Morphine use increases. There are some morphemes that are pretty easy that kids develop early on, like the ING morpheme, running, playing, jumping. Others are more complicated. Possessives and past tense, ED, those are complicated and take longer to learn and use properly. Grammar improves, sorry, syntax, how long your phrases and utterances and sentences get, starting to use connectors like let's go to the store and buy ice cream, things like that. Kids notably have a huge increase in their vocabulary, and this is called fast mapping. So during this age, you'll see a period where kids are learning sometimes 12 new words a day with little effort. Just overhearing the words can be enough to add those into their vocabulary. And I'm sure some of you who might be trying to learn a second language in adulthood really wish you could have some of that fast mapping. You'll also see what's called private speech. And this is when maybe I would walk past my child's bedroom and I would hear him in there talking to himself. Right? This is um, a great opportunity for kids to be practicing their communication skills, practicing talking, practicing conversations. And you might even see in these kids um, consistently having imaginary friends. Imaginary friends are a bit more common in only children and in girls, but there is nothing wrong with having an imaginary friend. It's really just a great opportunity to practice those social skills. And then your pragmatics also are increasing in early childhood. So the rules of conversations, like how to go back and forth, taking turns, how to listen, how to respond with good manners, things like that are pragmatics, and they are improving in that early childhood. Moving into middle childhood, now you're in elementary school, your vocabulary just continues to increase. Uh, some data says that we've got about 5,000 more words being added to our vocabulary. That's a lot. Syntax and grammar continues to improve. Of course, you're also developing literacy and writing skills, which is going to help with grammar and syntax. And your pragmatics improve. So your conversation skills get much better. And um, you might actually remember to ask someone, how are you doing? <laughs> what are you thinking? Instead of just answering questions. And also what I love is storytelling improves. Telling the story is actually pretty complicated cognitively. Holding in your mind a plot, the order that things happen, and putting that into a coherent narrative is complicated. And this gets better and better with age. I'm sure even as an adult, you know some people who are better at telling stories than other people. In adolescence, um, again, still improving in all of these areas, but some notable things that happen is the developing the ability to discuss abstract concepts. This comes with the formal operation stage. Oh, hold on. Okay, that's proof I have a landline. No one ever answers it. But anyway, sorry for the interruption. Adolescence. We can discuss abstract concepts like love and justice are great examples. Sorry, love is really complicated, right? You love your parents, but as you become an adolescent, you learn about romantic relationships 
and friendships and how those can be complicated. Justice, that is not black and white, right? Everyone in jail is not guilty. <laughs> that is not how it works. There can be rules and laws that are unfair and learning how to discuss those and think about that is part of an adolescent development. Learning to understand metaphors and satire, uh, adv kind of advanced levels of humor. That's something that comes in adolescence. Uh, metaphors are wonderful. Uh, I just read a beautiful one in your discussion board. Someone talking about um, how a neighborhood and community could be like a garden, right? And uh, if you plant plenty of seeds and water it, it might flourish. But if you leave it with nothing, how are people going to improve, right? And that's a great metaphor for some of the poverty that we see in our communities. Good job. <laughs> and then social perspective taking, right? This is kind of getting out of that egocentric mentality. Can't, oh my gosh, <laughs> sorry, hold on. Okay, social perspective taking, right? So again, getting out of that egocentric mentality and thinking about how things might look from someone else's perspective. This is hard to do, even into adulthood. Some people can be really challenged by this. One thing that really helps people get good at this is reading a lot of fiction, right? So if you read a lot and you are in these different worlds with different characters, totally different from you, empathizing with them, that can give you a lot of practice in social perspective taking. In adulthood, um, language still has some increasing vocabulary. You can think back to that crystallized intelligence. And also we talked in memory about the tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? So you know the word for something, but you just can't think of it. But generally your language development is pretty stable in adulthood. In older adults, we can start to see some declines. And we talked about that in the intelligence lecture. But here, when I'm thinking specifically about language, um, it's important to note that individuals who experience strokes are often having some deficits in language. So the area that's most commonly affected in the brain is on the left side of the brain following the middle cerebral artery. And in the front of that is Broca's area and towards the back of that is Wernicke's area. Broca's area is all about producing speech. So when you want to talk, you want to respond, when you need to find the word for something, that is Broca's area. And if that's damaged in a stroke, you may understand what people are saying to you, but you have trouble communicating yourself. Wernicke's aphasia or Wernicke's area in the back is understanding language. So when people are talking to you, Wernicke's area is processing that information. And so if you have damage to that area, you'll hear people, but you won't understand what they're saying. And so you can talk, but your responses aren't going to make sense because you can't understand language. So aphasia means a language disorder. So it could be in producing speech, could be in understanding speech and language. Okay. We have three general language acquisition theories that I wanna go over. The first is learning theory, which really is just behaviorism. So if you can remember B.F. Skinner and operant conditioning, reinforcement and punishment, this theory says we learn language through the environment. It is all nurture. Our parents say words and we wanna copy them and we get reinforced for that. That's how we're learning language. There's a lot of support for this. One of the advantages of this approach is that it does help explain individual differences and disorders. So variations in people's experiences can affect their language acquisition. Some of the disadvantages of this approach is it doesn't really explain how people can generate totally unique utterances. So you come up with a sentence that no one has ever even heard before. How did you do that? You weren't reinforced for hearing that and then repeating it. You're coming up with it on your own. Our second approach is the nativist approach. And this comes from the linguist Noam Chomsky. 
and it is completely on the side of nature. The idea is that you are born innately as a human with your brain areas devoted to language acquisition. And this is going to happen to you and it makes you uniquely human. And Noam Chomsky said you have in your brain a language acquisition device. Now this is just a label to say that you have brain areas for language. He was not a neuroscientist. There are pros and cons to this approach. Pro is it explains how humans learn language so quickly. That fast mapping, the critical period for language acquisition of birth to puberty. This is all supportive of the nativist approach. Um, the cons, um, oh, also another pro I don't have listed here is the fact that regardless of the language you're speaking or the culture you are in, kids are generally meeting their language milestones at the same time. Okay, and a con is just saying we have a language acquisition device. What does that even mean? Where is it? Well, that stuff isn't totally fleshed out by his theory, but it is saying we've got this nature component. The interactionist approach says we need both, right? You're born this way with this language um, area of the brain that's like a sponge ready to take in that information and help you learn to become fluent as quickly as possible. And then you've also got the environment reinforcing you for learning language and um, helping you along the way through your environmental experiences. That's the interactionist approach. We've got both. I think you could probably imagine that does the best explaining of how language is acquired. Okay, our last two topics, first literacy um, and then bilingualism. So literacy is learning to read, right? Your ability to read. Before we even talk about literacy though, research shows that kids really need to have pre-literacy skills. So before they ever learn to read, they need to be exposed to books and exposed to stories and reading. Some of those pre-literacy skills is learning the social routine of reading. You get a book, I don't know, here's a book, <laughs> right? It has a cover, you open it up, it has markings that are important, right? These are letters and letters are grouped together to form words. Maybe you can't read them yet, but you start to understand that in our culture, they go from left to right, top to bottom, and that when your uh, parent or sibling or whoever is reading you a story, they're looking at those. That's where the story's coming from. That you turn the pages and get to the end, the end. Learning that, enjoying reading, enjoying the um, relationship with the storyteller, those are all pre-literacy skills. And we want kids in preschool, and really from the time they're born, to be exposed to books and start to learn the social routine and meaning of reading. When an adult or an older person is reading a story, to a child, they there are typically three different types of reading styles. They're all good and should be used whenever appropriate. And hopefully that kid gets up the variety of these three types of reading styles. A describer style is reading the book, but at the same time, having that child look at the pictures, kind of describing, I'm assuming it's a picture book, have that child, you know, oh, can you find the, the tree in the picture? Do you see the animals, right? So you're not just reading the story, flipping the pages, kind of describing what's going on. You're having them look and really find different things on the page. The comprehender style is more about asking questions as you read the story to see if the child understands the story. Um, so who is this? What are they doing? How does Sam feel in this story? What do you think is going to happen next? Those types of questions. And then the performance oriented style is when you really perform the book. So you're not stopping necessarily to ask questions or have that child describe anything. You're more like performing. And some of my um, favorite Dr. Seuss books like Green Eggs and Ham, are definitely going to be, for me, more performance oriented. They're funny and they're all the rhymes and you get to be very emotive while you're reading that. 
Now, kids should be seeing or experiencing all these different types of styles. It helps them to understand all the different ways that you can read. Um, and, you know, you definitely want to make sure that child understands the stories that you're reading. Okay, so these are all kind of pre-literacy, beginnings of literacy skills. As we look at the life span, sort of, through high school here, we can outline the stages of literacy. Now, you don't need to like memorize these grades or anything. I just want you to generally know how this works. So it, before kindergarten, you're working on these pre-literacy skills, developing that understanding the routine of reading. Stage one, first grade, you're working a lot on phonological decoding, and that's sounding out the letters or those phonemes in the reading. Grades two and three, you're really practicing reading, learning how to read, increasing the speed of your reading and comprehension of your reading. Once you get to grade three, especially in the state of Ohio, where we have the third grade reading guarantee law, we are saying that kid needs to be a reader. They need, need to be able to pass with a certain level of proficiency in third grade because after third grade, you're not learning how to read anymore. You're now reading to learn. You're reading to learn social studies, to learn history, to learn science and all the other different subjects. And then in high school, focusing even more on that social perspective taking, reading to learn multiple points of view, to become a critical thinker, to be evaluating and comparing and contrasting and all these things we can do with written fiction and nonfiction. So I brought up phonological decoding. This is what would be called phonics when I was a kid. So this is one, um, approach to teaching literacy, where you are sounding out those phonemes to figure out what the word is. And this is not really how uh, we would be reading as practiced and accomplished readers. Um, we only do phonological decoding or phonics when we get to a word that we don't know. So maybe we're looking through this PowerPoint and we get to this word and have to stop and go plural, pluralistic, pluralistic. Okay, that was some phonological decoding. The majority of the time, what we're doing as accomplished readers is more of this whole language or sight word approach. So kids in first grade and even kindergarten, they're learning the phonological decoding, but they're also being taught the whole language approach, which is seeing and recognizing a whole word without breaking it down. So you will start in kindergarten with sight words. You might have a list of 50 sight words that you hope that child will be able to see and recognize instantly by the end of kindergarten. And you will start with the most commonly used words in English, like the, and, or, if, and on and on and on, right? So these are all like flashcards. You've got a few seconds, can you see it and say it, recognize it? That is whole language. And that is how we read. Like I said, we only use as adults, we only use phonological decoding when we don't know the word. It looks unfamiliar to us. So using both of these approaches is ideal. You wanna be doing both of these in school. I also like to point out that over the past 40, 50 years, <laughs> gets longer the older I am, right? Um, our public schools have moved from a cultural assimilation model to a pluralistic society model, which is very good, but we still have a lot more work to do on this. The cultural assimilation approach is the fact that if we look back in the 1950s and 60s, the um, idea is to take these differing cultures, people who belong to different cultural groups, and let's all assimilate us into one American culture. Everybody's kind of the same. And you can actually look at this uh, trend if you look at baby names. If we go back to the 1950s, we have people in all different from all different um, races, ethnic groups in the United States. Their children are being born here, and we're naming them very common names. John, Mary, Nancy, Shirley, um, I'm thinking all girl names, right? Um, 
Robert, William. These are all names that everyone recognizes. We all are assimilating. Well, over the decades, we've learned that diversity isn't something that we should be squashing. It's something that we should be learning about and celebrating. There's nothing wrong with diversity, right? The more we learn about other groups, the more we can understand them and recognize them and value them. And that is the pluralistic society model, which has resulted in introducing uh, reading into the curriculum that is um, representing other cultural groups. And that's really important. And hopefully you realize that we still have a long way to go with that. But the foundation is there. It just needs to actually happen. Okay, so our last topic of bilingualism, very quickly, I can't spend a lot of time on this. Um, some of you are bilingual or even have are fluent in more than two languages, which is wonderful. I am not, and it's very sad for me. <laughs> it is easiest to learn a second language before puberty. So people who are born into homes where more than one language is spoken, that is really ideal. Starting to learn a second language when you are 17, not ideal. It's gonna be so much harder. And we know that kids who are bilingual show um, better academic outcomes, uh, life outcomes, um, and higher intelligence scores, decision-making. So language and cognitive development um, is positively affected by being bilingual. When we look at our school systems, we can identify kids who come into schools where English is not their first language. And these kids are labeled in some areas as ELL or English language learners, or even um, ESL, English as a second language. And many of these kids might be immigrants where their parents don't speak English. And there are a couple of things that happen here is sometimes these ex kids experience what's called subtractive bilingualism, which means that they start to lose their first language because they're going to a school where English is the only language that's spoken. And sometimes even in their homes, parents want that child to learn English so much that they stop speaking their native language and just are speaking English in the home. And this is not ideal, right? You wanna keep both languages. The best approach for learning for these children is the dual language approach where they're getting instruction in both their native language and in English. Um, obviously this can be a practical challenge um, I grew up in South Florida where m most people were bilingual speaking Spanish and English. So this was pretty easy to accomplish in my public school system to have um, teachers who spoke Spanish and English. Um, but it's not always the case. But that is the best scenario. You want children to be able to use both languages and to be bilingual. Okay, um, this is the end of our lecture. And... Um, only got interrupted twice with phone calls. <laughs> Sorry about that. And good luck. You are now, after studying this, ready to uh, take exam two.